Hello everyone and welcome back. We are mixing it up a little bit here today. As you can see, I am not in my office. I'm in the van. I intended, when I bought this van in December, I intended to be on the road most of the time in the van doing my blurb job from the road and then whatever else I could pull off uh, in addition. All of that is out the window with COVID, but that's okay. I think all of us have to redefine patience uh, during this time and I hope everybody out there is, is doing okay with it. Uh, today's Q&A is about about print, about printing in general. It could be about Blurb. It could be about any other printing service. A little history. I think I made my first darkroom prints in the late 80s. And I, like a lot of other photographers, when that image came up in the developer for the first time, I knew what kind of trouble I was in because I was so hooked on that idea and that process. Printing images just took over my life in the strangest of ways. I've mentioned this before. I had a scholarship uh, to a, a different college to go in a different direction in my life. And really the second I saw that image come up in the developer, I took that whole opportunity and just tossed it out and turned right and became a photographer. So if you had any idea or any question about my mental capacity, you will now know that I have a fundamental and tragic flaw that I chose photography over geology. Okay, maybe not. I reached out on YouTube and asked people to send in printing questions and, uh, they're fun. I like printing questions because I've been doing this for so long. I think there's a lot of things that I sort of take for granted that other people might get stuck with or struggle with or have just never encountered before. So we're going to start there. I have a lot. There's no way I can get through all these. What I'm going to do is monitor the clock and hopefully the camera is not going to die. Yesterday, the camera just kept turning off by itself. And I don't mean just stop recording. I mean, turning off by itself. So you know my luck with cameras. I'm hoping it doesn't happen today, but I'm actually going to take the first question ask first and then go to the last question if that makes sense for no particular reason first question came in from Aaron who I haven't seen or talked to for quite some time other than brief little snippets online here and there Aaron had a question I haven't printed with blurb in quite a while but I was wondering about the binding options do they have a true case binding option so we have three primary binding options. We have library bind, perfect bind, and saddle stitch, depending on what it is you're getting. But we also have a division that is the best kept secret in the professional photography world. I'm not really sure why so few people seem to know about this, but Blurb has a division called large order services. We do custom high volume offset books, and we have for years, but for some reason, the photo community uh, has either missed our marketing or maybe we're not doing a good enough job marketing the fact that we have this division. One of the entertaining things that I do is when I do talks and lectures pre-COVID, I always bring with me a giant set of sample books. And I like to bring large order services books because they're custom. They have foil stamp, deboss, emboss, printed end sheets, placeholder ribbons, checkerboard head and foot bands, et cetera, stuff like that, slip cases. And photographers will always walk up, publishing people will always walk up and pick them up and say, well, these aren't blurb books. And I always make a joke about, oh yeah, I'm bringing books from other, other printers. Uh, yes, they are blurb books. And most people are surprised when they see them. So in addition to our entire POD operation, print on demand, we have offset. So if you're looking for a custom book, you can also go that route. That was a good question, Aaron. Okay, the next question is, could you briefly describe the different papers, et cetera, Uncoded Pearl and your recommendations? I'm glad someone asked this right off the bat because this is a very tricky question. I have probably received this question over a thousand times over the past, I don't know how many years. I can make suggestions or recommendations about paper, but the tricky part about paper is it's, it's subjective. So for example, Blurb has a standard paper. This is for photo books only. Standard paper, a line of premium papers, and then a line of pro line papers. And in terms of quality, you would start with standard, go to premium, and then go to pro line. But depending on the project and your budget and the goal and the item you're making and the price point, the paper that might make the most sense is the standard paper. And also in terms of coding and on surface, for example, the pro line papers, which are at the top, there's a, there's a coded version called Pearl and there's an uncoded version. One is not better than the other. They're just totally different. They will hold different amounts of ink. You will get different blacks. You will get different contrast, different saturation, and also a different texture and weight to the paper. Paper can be alarmingly complicated if you allow it to be. The number one thing I can suggest is to order a swatch kit from Blurb, and secondly is to do some testing. And when you do a test book, you don't necessarily have to design your entire book and do this giant 12 by 12, 200 page book and run a test. Why not do a 20 page soft cover version of your book, of a sample of the work that's in there, and then just fire that off and have it printed on different papers to get your 
opinion of what your work looks like on the papers. I'm gonna say this over and over on this particular Q&A. There is no substitute for making tests. I wish you could print just a sample of a book and test it that way, but you can't. The best way to do a test book is to just order a small soft cover version of what you're doing, but there is no substitute. And for some reason, I find there's a lot of people that have a reluctance to do testing when it comes to bookmaking. They'll test like crazy with their cameras and their software and go into the field. But when it comes to making a book, even folks who've never made a book before will often say, well, I don't wanna to have to make a test book. And my question back to them is always, what happens in the creative world, art, illustration, design, et cetera, that doesn't come through revision? Everything good, novel. A novelist doesn't sit down and bang out a final, final draft the first time they sit down to write. They do the first draft, the second draft, the third draft. It's being continually edited through revision. And that's what really good bookmaking is about. Okay, point, this is another great question. This is from Ibrahim. I get overwhelmed with having to choose a few out of the billions of photos I take. How do you choose from them all? Also, how do you decide what stories to tell, especially when photographs don't seem to relate one another? So, Ibrahim, this is a tricky, tricky question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my opinion. I think when digital photography arrived, wait a second. I don't think when digital photography arrived, I know when digital photography arrived. Photographers began to ac accumulate exponentially more images than they did in the film, film era. It was easy, it was unlimited. You had flashcards, boom, you filled it up, there was no penalty, there was no cost, per, really no cost per exposure, even though there was, but it, on the surface, it really didn't seem like that. Having billions of images, millions of images, even hundreds of thousands of images can be an, an absolute massive problem not only in the fact that you have to edit, but you also have to store all these images. And this is the white elephant in the photography, especially the digital photography space, is archiving. Everybody is very nonchalant about this. They all wanna throw out some easy solution. Ah, put it in the, cl in the cloud. Well, if you have 50 to 100 terabytes of, of data, putting that in the cloud is no easy task. And then you, have to, you need redundancy in the cloud and then you have to pay for it all. So my point to you is when you're capturing in the field, there is no good reason to overshoot scenes because editing digital files like on a laptop screen or an iPad screen is not easy for anyone. Good things get missed. You're looking at tiny thumbnails. People get lazy. So I am very, very cautious in the field when I make photographs, especially when I know I'm going to print. I try to shoot digital the same way that I shoot film and I'm very selective. I don't overshoot because I have the ability to do so. I think the downside uh, outweighs the upside. Uh, also, I had training. I spent four years in photography school, and a big part of that was learning how to edit and sequence your work. And so I've been practicing this now since about 1990. God knows how many years that is. It's way too many. It sounds impossible. Like nothing was, nothing existed in 1990. Miami Vice was already over. And, you know, most of the good things in the world had already been discovered. And so now we are where we are. So I learned how to edit. I learned how to sequence. I learned how to control myself in the field. But the number one point I can make to you is practice. You have to edit. So when you do a shoot, think about things like completing a shoot and then saying, what are the 10 single most important images to this project? What are the top five? And what is the single best photograph I made? And do that each time you go out. And when you think about a book historically, which is a tricky thing to say, but historically, if you're gonna think about a book of photographs, maybe think about 50 as, as a range. And again, there's every exception to this rule a thousand times over, but maybe think about 50 pictures from a project that you've worked on for a long, long time. Having said that, you could do a book from a single image. Um, I've been thinking and dreaming about doing this for years, doing a series of books based on a single image, which I will never have time for, so hopefully one of you will steal that idea and do it. Okay, great, another great question here. Powell, which is, or Pavel, P-A-W-E-L. What's the best way to promote a zine when you're not on social media? Great question. Number one would be an email newsletter. Uh, if you have a website that is all your own and you have a blog that is all your own and you develop a voice and a style and an actual audience of people, the next logical step is an email newsletter. I got a really good one today from a photographer uh, named Catherine Lutenegger, who I interviewed uh, back in Australia a couple of years ago. She's a European-based photographer. I wanna say she's Swiss. Her email is amazing. Michael Clark here in Santa Fe is another photographer that has the most mind-blowing newsletter I've seen. That is a very, very strategic way of marketing a zine. I know for certain if we, like uh, AG23 is the zine that I'm involved in with Beyond Clothing. And I think if we had, 
in a perfect world, if we had international distribution at an affordable price, which is not easy right now, it is incredibly difficult to do that. If we'd had that, we could have sold out the zine literally probably, I think, in, in a week or so, 2,000 copies, just based on email newsletters and, and word of mouth. I mean, it really would have gone that fast because I'm not a big fan of social. I don't want to do social. I don't really want to talk about the zine on social. I'd much rather do films like this and talk about it. Uh, let's see. Getting ready to do my first show at a local coffee shop. How much importance do you place on the finishing touches of printing, such as mounting, matting, and framing? I can see it would be very easy to overdo it from a cost standpoint and easily price myself out of sales, but I also want a high quality end product. How do you find the right balance? Balance is the key word. It depends on the content of the work, the scope of the work, and the seriousness of the work. And I think the installation is hugely important when it ties into the overall project. You wouldn't go do a quick sort of informal project and then necessarily turn around and spend a fortune on high level, beautiful, hand done framing. It may not make sense. You may not even use frames at all. And so it really depends on the scope of the project, the scale of the project, the seriousness of it, and what your, uh, what your eventual delivery tactic is for that. Um, I've seen exhibitions where the images were printed on on uh, self-adhesive vinyl and put on the floor of the gallery. So when you walked in, you were actually standing on the images. There is a million things to do. My advice to you is to forget everything you know about photography, forget everything you know about bookmaking, and this goes to everyone who is listening to this film. Forget what you know about photography, forget what you know about filmmaking, forget what you know about exhibitions and dream up your own scenario. There is so much conformity. Good coffee shops are interesting to me because they are democratic. You're going to expose that work to people who would not necessarily go to an art gallery. I'm not a huge fan of art galleries and photo galleries uh, as much as I used to be because they seem very limiting to me. I've never really quite felt at home in that space. I go in and I feel like someone's watching me or they're sizing me up, determining whether or not they think I'm going to make a purchase or not. And so that's not my favorite way of exhibiting. I once saw the World Press Photo Organization exhibit their pictures of the year World Press Photo winners in the middle of the mall in Santa Monica. And they had warning signs up about graphic nature of the photographs, et cetera. And I loved it because it took that work, which would typically be exhibited in a museum and have a very limited exposure to the public. And all of a sudden it put it in a mall and it was fantastic. So that would be my advice is use your budget wisely and use your budget in ways that most people wouldn't think of. I mean, think about point of purchase at the counter of a coffee shop. What if you had a piece of self-adhesive vinyl that was over the surface of where every single person is checking out? It would be impossible to miss that image. These are just one of many, many ideas that you can use to rethink what all of us have been trained to think about what we're supposed to do.